Hi, I'm Susan with Westchester Township History Museum, and today we are going to discuss some of the different ways people have used the land throughout history. So we are going to begin our discussion at about the early 1800s. People were definitely here using the land before that, the Potawatomi were here, um, but we are looking at these groups that came in and created drastic changes to our landscape that we can still see today. So those are the changes and the land uses that we're going to be discussing. So let's get started. So people have been using the land in this area for a long, long time, but the big changes to our landscape came with the land use that started when settlers started to move in in the early 1800s. So when they came here, they needed to start farms to support their family. And this area used to be covered in trees and wetlands. So when they got here, they had to clear all of those trees to create these big open spaces so they could build their homes as well as build their barns for their animals and start raising those crops they were gonna use to help their family survive. As more and more settlers moved here, other industries also started to look at this area. And one huge one came through in the 1850s. The railroad industry came through and it had a huge impact on our landscape. They had to clear big areas of woods to get a lot of timber to build the actual tracks. They had to clear the right of ways so they had a nice clear path to put those tracks on. And also a lot of people came into the region to work on these railroads. They helped build them, they helped maintain them, and they eventually went off to build their own businesses or their own industries. Um, agriculture was greatly impacted by the railroad. Now with all this new cleared land, people could buy a lot more farmland, they could make bigger farms. And because of the railroads, they had a lot more places to ship the things they grew. So they could sell it to places like Chicago and make a lot more money. Also, all the businesses benefit from the railroad. Having this really easy mode of transportation meant people could get in and out of the area more easily and goods could be sold from our factories into markets like Chicago and all over the country. So like I said, the railroads coming through benefited a lot of different industries, particularly agriculture, especially at first. So one family that really benefited from those railroads in terms of their farm was the Shelbergs. So this land you see here used to be covered in trees and people came in and cut those trees down to sell to the railroad companies to use to build and maintain the tracks. That left behind a lot of land covered in stumps that nobody really wanted. But it also meant that families, immigrant families like the Shelbergs, could come in and buy that land for not a lot of money. And they could create their homes and their farms that they needed to support their families. And the Shelbergs did just that in 1869. They purchased the property, they cleared it, they built the structures they needed, they built their house, and they've grown that farm over time. The National Park now owns the far farm and you can actually come visit it today. The railroads also influenced what farmers like the Shelbergs had on their farms. So in 1908, the South Shore Line came through and it had to stop pretty close to their farm here in the dunes. So now that they had a way to easily get their goods to the train station to ship into Chicago, the Shelbergs decided to add dairy cows to their farm. Because now the milk they produced could be shipped into Chicago and sold to people there and they could make more money. One type of land it took a long time for people to figure out how to use was wetlands. So for a long time, most of Indiana's population was further south. There's a lot of marshland up here. They couldn't figure out how to build on it or plant crops on it. So they just weren't using it very much. But around the same time all the other industries came in, the agriculture, the pioneers, um, the railroads in the 1850s, they had learned how to drain the wetlands. So they could use that land for other purposes like farmland, building railroads, uh, building other types of industry. Once they figured out how to drain the wetlands, they used them pretty quickly. Um, and all that marshland we used to have here started to disappear. Right around the time the railroads came into the area, they also started mining sand, literally taking the sand out of here to use in other places. The railroads needed it because they had to build up their uh, land in some places so the tracks had a smoother path. But also, it, we were loading it up into train cars and shipping it off to places like Chicago to help build up their shoreline, and down to Muncie, Indiana to the Ball Brothers Glass Factory to make jars. So tons and tons of sand, even into the 50s, the 1950s is being shipped out of our region off to other places. And some of our sand dunes actually started to disappear. One, the Hoosier Slide, which some say was the biggest sand dune in what is now the Indiana Dunes National Park, completely disappeared. It's now just a flat parking lot. So tons of sand was being shipped out of the area and it had a huge impact on the landscape here. The combination of the railroads, Lake Michigan and all the other waterways and all this open land right on the lakeshore created an ideal spot for the steel industry to move in in the early 1900s. Um, they used this open space to build their large steel making facilities. 
The railroad transportation and the water transportation using barges, large ships, made it really easy to get the iron ore and coal here, and also made it easy to get those finished steel products out to the markets to the people that wanted to buy them. Also, you need a lot of water in the steel making process to cool that steel, and having Lake Michigan right in their backyard made that process a lot easier and faster. So the steel mills moving in had a huge impact on the landscape of our area, just like all those industries we talked about before. Right around the time the steel industry saw the many benefits of being in this area, a lot of people began to see all the recreational ways they could use the land. So the ways they could use it to relax or play. They would come out here from Chicago and take long hiking trips to the dunes, see all the different ecosystems, all the things they could do out here. And they started to get concerned that industry was starting to use up all these natural areas. And they started looking for a way that they could conserve them. The first group that worked to preserve part of our Indiana dunes was called the Prairie Club. The Prairie Club came out from Chicago and really fell in love with the dunes. Um, people like ecologist Henry Chandler Coles, our, uh, landscape architect Jens Jensen, activist Beth Sheehan, and artist, the artist Frank Dudley all worked together in their effort to create a sand dunes national park. Um, they would have big meetings in Chicago about it. They did all kinds of campaigns to promote it. Um, Stephen Mather, a member of the Prairie Club, even got elected as the first superintendent of the National Park Service. But their efforts to create a national park had to be put on hold once the U.S. entered World War I. There just wasn't the resources to also create this park. But the members of the Prairie Club didn't give up. They kept working and they eventually got the Indiana Dunes State Park created in 1925 and it opened to the public in 1926. So they did succeed in preserving part of our Indiana Dunes natural landscape. The creation of the Indiana Dunes State Park was a huge success in conserving the dunes, but people in the area did not give up on their dream of creating a national park in the dunes someday. So industry kept moving into the area and there was talk of creating a big public port right on Lake Michigan for all the different steel mills and other factories to use. So a group led by Dorothy Buell met, a group of all women met, and they formed the Save the Dunes Council in 1952. And their goal was to create an even larger section of the dunes that was conserved into the Indiana Dunes National Park, the National Lake Shore. So they worked tirelessly. They lobbied members of Congress. They made phone calls. They raised money. They talked to everyone in the area about the importance of making sure we set aside a large section of this natural area for people to enjoy for generations to come. There was a big fight between people who wanted to create the port and people who wanted to conserve the area as a park. But eventually, through all the tireless efforts of the Save the Dunes Council, Congress authorized not only the creation of the port, but also the creation of the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore in 1966. That National Lakeshore is now known as Indiana Dunes National Park, fully realizing that dream that the Prairie Club started way back in the early 1900s. That decision in 1966 to both create a port and create the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore was about finding a balance on how to use the land for industry and use the land for recreation and conservation. This desire for balance between the two is still going on today. And we have a lot of people in the region working to figure out how we can keep areas natural and still maintain the industry that we have here. But luckily, we have a lot of good people in the region figuring out how to use the land in good ways. So again, I'm Susan Swarner with the Westchester Township History Museum. Thank you so much for joining me today.